In all honesty, I am running out of things to say about the Dallas Cowboys here. For those who didn't see, um, obviously I missed the video for the Patriots game. Uh, I had a couple family things come up and just a hectic week in general. I'm not going to lament on that too much other than to say we've seen Jason Garrett come under more fire in the last week in terms of, I think, outward pressure. I mean, we've seen that for years, but it seems like the Cowboys, based on their reactions, based on how Jerry Jones was talking earlier this week, it seems like that was finally getting under his skin. And, you know, say what you want. They they had a, a couple fleeting chances to win that New England game, and they didn't get the job done. They seemed unprepared, undercoached, and in terms of the game management itself, they, they pretty much blew that as well, like at several key moments. And so this was it. Like, okay, all week long we've heard all this criticism and all we've heard, you know, you have, of course, the Jason Garrett thing where he's saying like, oh, well, you know, we don't really, uh, we don't really pay attention to in-game like win probability or analytics or anything like that. Dude, if you model anything after Belichick, who, you, who you've said you're friends with and have a great respect for, then you should know the Patriots utilize in-game analytics constantly like they are at the forefront of that in fact bill belichick will call different plays to the very end of the game just to skew the statistics on their play calling tendencies just as a precaution that's how obsessed he is with it he's done that for years the ravens one of the best teams in the nfl this year and you know they've got the heisman front runner heisman front runner former heisman winner mvp uh potential front runner lamar jackson they use it on every single play analytics. It's it's all about new age approach. Jason Garrett saying we don't we don't refer to that like we'll refer to it in the week leading up to it to help us prepare, but then end game, now nah, we throw it aside. Seriously? That that's such a garbage makes no sense mentality. It's insane. He's living in the 90s. He thinks that's how things are done. And it's insane to be at this point. But here you go. He's faced all this criticism all week. Here we go. Thanksgiving game against the Bills. Bills are 8-3, and three, led by Cole Beasley and uh, Allen. And how do they answer? By putting together probably initially the best first half quarter they've put together in 9, 10 weeks of the season. And then following it up with pretty much crap play the rest of the way. Cowboys open the game with a nice drive all the way down the field. Touchdown, Jason Witten. Up 7-0. Defense holds for a little while then while the offense sputters. Every now and then they would move the ball. They'd get to midfield. You know, they even went for it on fourth down at their own 20-yard line. They would move the ball, but they could never sustain a drive. Now, the Bills are a very good defense. And, yeah, it, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough sledding. So this was a big challenge for the offense. No one ever questioned that. The problem is that the defense, as it has done all year, faltered. It fractured and it broke and it started getting run over. And the offense started making inexcusable mistakes, right? Dak, I'll say this. I am a huge Dak supporter. This was not a good game for Dak. There were times where his decision-making, where his playmaking were just lacking. The heart was always there. You had a very key third down the Dallas Cowboys needed, third and 10. And not only does he scramble for it, escape the pocket, escape a potential sack and scramble for it, he bulldozes through the defensive back at the sticks to make sure he gets it. Problem is, the Cowboys end up, as they did so many times, drove deep into Bill's territory, even into the red zone, and came up empty-handed. Brett Maher missed the 35-yard field goal before half. That would have made it 13-10. to 10. Uh, You then have him miss a 45-yarder, I believe it was. I believe it was 45. It could have been 47. Um, later in the third quarter as well, and it just it was just a kick to the nuts every single time. The fact is, we've been talking about Maher and the Cowboys needing to have a real kicking competition since all the way back in training camp. And you had all these names still floating around out there. Uh, Bryant, one of them. And the Cowboys just always said, like, ah, 
we we don't we don't think that's necessary. They never really had a real kicking competition. It was kind of assumed like okay, Maher's going to be the guy. Like they brought in a guy in preseason to kick, but it wasn't a real competition. It was just someone to have to throw out there uh, while they still pretty much set up Maher, propped him up as the guy. And uh, we said, I, I swear you can go back and look at the early season uh, or preseason even videos we did, James and I, and possibly Law and them. We talked specifically about there are going to be a couple games this year that Brett Maher probably costs you because he's not a good kicker. He's got an incredible leg. He, he's the only kicker in NFL history to have three makes from 62-plus yards. Fantastic. He'll never have anyone take that away from him. He's also not a good kicker when you start talking about the 40s, the mid-40s. Certainly, he gets shaky in there. He can make a kick where there's no pressure, right? Someone sends you out there for a 59, 60-yard kick, whatever. Nobody expects you to make that. It's all it, You can't look bad in that situation, so it's easy. There's no pressure. But when it's set up for a 35 or a 45-yard field goal in a game where you've got to have it, you are hemorrhaging. And if you can just get those six points, then suddenly it's like, okay, it's 23 to 16 or whatever, and we're at least still hanging on. We're still in this. That's what they needed. They couldn't get it. Would have been 16-16 at one point, I think. I'm trying to remember the uh, series of events on that, but point being, Maher sucked. And Cowboys kept coming up empty on drives, hooking everything wide right. And then you get to a point where Maher, um, where Maher is not the problem. Cowboys get down... And initially, they're called for a touchdown on a, a great effort from Michael Gallup, but Gallup can't get the second foot down. I was shocked they even called it a touchdown on the spot because you could tell in live in live speed he did not get that other foot down in bounds. So it's, of course, overturned, and now you're set up for fourth and seven. Because Maher's missed a couple kicks, even though it's a chip shot, you're worried about his confidence, Garrett feeling that pressure. I don't want to kill Garrett for that one decision to, to go for it on fourth and seven. Now I'll criticize the call and underneath check down to Zeke, just hoping that he can take it the seven yards or whatever uh, turn and take it upfield. And they were closing on him anyway. I don't think he would have made it anyway. I hate the play call and Dak had a piss poor pass on it. Uh, that goes incomplete right at Zeke's feet, even though there's no one around him, but I don't fault Garrett for that decision in that moment because Romo even said as much. This kind of feels like it might be four down territory for them with the way this game is going. And I, that's how I felt about it. So I, I don't want to kill Garrett for that one decision. I want to instead say, hey, your team knows the pressure you've been under all week. They know you are, you're coaching for your job. If, if there was ever a time for your team to rally around you, and they've done it in the past, this was that moment. And they didn't. The defense continued to falter, continued to get beat the Bills drove down the field at will, it seemed like, in the second half. I mean, you, you had freaking Josh Allen go, what was his stats here? 19 of 24 for 231 yards and a touchdown. Now, the plus side, you did get four sacks, and he had only been sacked twice in the three games previous combined. So you got some pressure with your interior line. That's great. But there were times where the Cowboys just, they couldn't put any real pressure on him. Aside from those four sacks... He pretty much was allowed just to sit back there and do what he wants. And you know, if you can keep him in the pocket, he's not as good. It's when he gets moving that he's a threat, not just the rushing ability. Obviously, he ran for a touchdown as well. 10 carries, 43 yards. He's a he's a poor man's uh, Lamar Jackson, but you know what? There's only a couple of those out there anyway, so even if he's a poor man's version, he's still going to look pretty nice to most people. And that's, the Cowboys just let him play to his game. Speaking of someone playing to their game and the Cowboys doing nothing to stop him, Cole freaking Beasley had a day, everybody. Cole Beasley targeted seven times, six catches, 110 yards, and a touchdown with a long of 29. Think about that. 110 yards for Beasley, 230 total in the game for Allen. You let Cole Beasley, the guy who is here with you, for years, the guy who you went up against in practice every day, you know exactly what he likes to do. You've seen how other teams have taken him away from you when you want to utilize him, and you did nothing to account for that. You didn't keep Allen in the pocket. You were fooled, horribly fooled, when the Bills wanted to roll out a trick play. And it just seemed like 
it was like a lack of discipline, a lack of focus, and just poor preparation. And if that's not coaching, I don't know what it is. Like, this was a game they needed to play for Garrett. Now, I know he's Jerry's not going to fire him. I don't think that's going to happen. I think he's going to run out the year with the rest of his contract, and then they're just not going to re-sign him. I think that's what it's going to go. After the game, Jerry was even basically saying, well, you know, it's uh, I got a lot of faith in Garrett and his ability to overcome adversity, and... You know, I still believe that we can win out, and I believe in the redemption story. We can get hot. We can maybe even have a Super Bowl role. Like, he, he's he's in, I think, delusion right now, Jerry is. He's in denial, and he's not willing or able to accept that this team is playing like ass. This team has lost, what, six of its last nine? It's abysmal how bad this team is playing right now. And they don't... They don't deserve a playoff berth. They might get it because they're leading the division no matter what. After the end of this week, they're still going to be in first place. It's all going to come down to can they go to Philadelphia and hold hold stat there. They might be able to because Philly's falling apart too, and our division's kind of trash this year. But the Cowboys are now 0-5, I believe, against teams with a winning record at the time of playing each other. And yeah, that really freaking shows. It's not, it, it's getting worse is the thing, right? It's not just failing to execute, right? In the New England game, as bad as it was for the first half, that was a game they still could have had. It was still right there on the table for them to have, and they just didn't get the job done. Now, you had some controversy in that game as well with the bogus tripping calls, but I think the game, I don't want to put it at that. I just want to say, hey, they didn't look well coached. They didn't look prepared. The game was managed really poorly by Garrett. And Garrett just was typical Garrett in the sense that he was trying to coach not to lose as opposed to coaching to win. He was being conservative and passive instead of being aggressive and setting the tone himself. That's the impression that that game left me with for Garrett. And this week, it seemed like, you know, we, we've seen this with Garrett too. When In recent years, whenever there's a, a significant harsh storyline surrounding Garrett and his team, whatever the the people, the public, the media is screaming at him. He takes it to heart for one week. After that Minnesota game where he ran the ball on, what was it? Third and two, second and two, and then third and five. And he ends up setting up fourth and five for the Cowboys. Uh, in that situation, people are like, dude, Dak is passing for days on them. And you just completely train wrecked and torpedoed your own game winning drive. You took the, you snatched defeat from the mouth of victory, from the jaws of victory. And yeah, that's that's what he did. And then what happened the next week? In Detroit, he let Dak sling it the whole time. And to close out a game, to get those crucial first downs, to run out the clock and end any chance of a Detroit comeback, he passed it. He let Dak throw the ball, and it worked that week. And he was like, ah, oh, see, there you go. We weren't running to get those downs third and four. We were throwing the ball right there. See, see, I did what you wanted. And then this week, what do you do? As I mentioned earlier, fourth and one, Fourth and one, I believe it was, at his own 20. He goes for it. And he goes for fourth down, I think, three times in the game. And it it just... It feels like he's doing it to appease you. It's not that he's doing it because he's learned anything. And that's one thing that drives me crazy about Garrett. Cowboys fall behind in this game 26-7. to They were down 19 points with like six minutes remaining. Dak gets another touchdown... His second of the day, and Dak, like I said, he wasn't good today. 49 pass attempts for Dak is generally too high. It's not always too high. Sometimes the game dictates that, i.e. Minnesota. But this is a game where you were running the ball well. The problem is, because your defense kind of imploded, you you were so far behind, you had to pass it because you couldn't afford to let the clock just keep burning on you. Dak, 32 of 49, 355, 11.1 attempt, two touchdowns, one pick sacked four times for basically a 92 QBR. Zeke, uh, 12 carries for 71 yards, 5.9 a pop, had, I think, three runs of at least 20 yards in this game, one of 30. He hasn't done that all year, and he gave them to you this game. This was a game to try and ride Zeke more. Dak also had four carries for 25 yards. Cooper, after getting shut out for just, I think, the third time in his career last week at New England, He comes back, eight catches for 85 yards, 10.6 a pop. Zeke, 
receiving. Great day for him. Seven for 66. So Zeke, well over 100 yards, pushing basically 150 yards at that point in terms of total yards. And he played well. Gallup, three for 63. Cobb gave you some moments. Witten gave you that opening drive touchdown and the two-point conversion at the end of the game. Like, it was too little too late, obviously, at that point. Dallas getting to 15 points on the day. But it just... It's baffling watching this team because you see, you you just see like they have talent. They're just not playing up to it. And we can keep saying, hey, at some point it's just on the players to live up to it. But when it comes to preparation and mental readiness, if that's not partly on the coach, who is that on? Like if, if, if your team is coming out there consistently and looking unprepared or just not ready to play a game, like not mentally focused and sharp. If if that's the story for 10 games or whatever, 10 straight games that you're slow to start, let alone the whole freaking year at this point, Cowboys 6 and 6 now, then yeah, that's really going to point to the coach being the problem. Your team has to play for you. You have to instill either some discipline or send some kind of message to your team. But Garrett doesn't do that. Garrett doesn't really hold guys accountable. That I don't have any question that Garrett shows his team a different side than the media sees. Obviously, no question at all about that. But from what we do see and the result we get on the field, it just seems like, for whatever reason, he's not dialed in. He's not clued in, and it's killing this team. Dallas in this game out possessed 33 minutes, 33-18 to 26-42. They had more total yards, basically 70 total yards more than uh, the Bills, nearly 460 yards of offense for Dallas. Out passed them 355 to 259. Basically, even on rushing, the Bills got a 124 to 103 edge. Dallas, 10 more first downs than the Bills. Fewer penalties, five compared to seven. They did have those two turnovers, one of which was the turnovers on downs uh, deep in Bill's territory. Uh, Four sacks apiece, and Dallas ran seven more plays. This was the Brett Maher situation. I mean, just take back those six points if you get them. It's 26-21. I know that's obviously still a loss, but that changes the complex a little bit. Then maybe you don't feel like you have to go for fourth and seven at the Bills 11 or whatever it was, or I think it was the seven yard line, then you can actually take those points. And hey, again, still not enough. But at that point, you're at least in the game and you're not just getting blown out on Thanksgiving on your home field. This is this is a catastrophe where this team is at. The only reason we're doing anything is because our division is trash and we're 4-0 in the division. We still got the Eagles and we still got the Redskins left on our schedule. We got a Bears team that has a very good defense, but their offense is garbage, and their second or their third year quarterback, Trubisky, doesn't look like he knows even who or what he is at this point in life. You got that on your schedule. There's still I I don't have any faith in this team to walk into any game, even games that they should win handily, like the Detroit game. That was a game set up for them to win in blowout fashion. They didn't. I know the they essentially won by two scores. The the um, Lions get a late touchdown and attempt an onside kick, but whatever. The game was basically done. The Rams are another one who they're a team that you just don't know what they are at this point because they are six and five currently. They just got their ass blown out against the Ravens. I think forty four to six in L A. So yeah, there's a lot of questions here. Points per game, I mean, without previewing that one too much, Dallas is the better offense in terms of points per game, uh, better in terms of points allowed, better in total yards, better in pass yards, better in rush yards by a long mile. Yards per game, they're better, and uh, and turnover differential, they're even a little bit better there. So, across the board, Dallas should be favored even in that game. It's in Dallas, which helps, but... uh, I have no faith left in this team. This season feels like a wash because even if in a very, very bad NFC East they win the division and therefore get to host a playoff game, they're not going to do anything. I, I just don't see it. I declared last year when they were 3-5 and five that the Dallas Cowboys were broken. 
And I ended up being proven kind of an idiot in that case. And hey, I'll welcome that. If I make a declaration, if I have a bad take and it, it's exposed as a bad take, fine, I'll, I'll own that. That's what happened last year. I, I declared after the Tennessee game, the first game with Amari Cooper, that this this team is broken. And they responded by winning seven of their last eight games in the regular season and winning a playoff game. So, yeah, they were really, really good the rest of the way. I don't see that coming this year. Unless somehow Jerry changed his mind on a dime just from what we heard after the game and said, you know what, I'm done with this Garrett thing. I understand no interim head coach has ever gone and won the Super Bowl. I get it. But at the same time, I don't see a team that's playing for Jason. So I'm going to roll the dice and say that we can get at least a little bit of a spark under whether it's Chris Richard or, hell, I would take John Kitna at this point before I banked on, okay, let's see this team. I, I expect this team to rally behind Jason Garrett. Again, the schedule is set up at such that four games left, they might could do it. I just don't have faith in them to do it. This season feels like it's going to come down to Sunday, December 22nd. It's a 3.30 game in Philadelphia. Feels like that's where the season's going to uh, culminate. Even though there's one more game after that, you still got to go and play the Redskins in Dallas. It just feels like, eh, at that point, any chance Philly has will be there. Philly has a much easier schedule in the next three, but Dallas essentially just has to win because of their records currently, Dallas just has to win one of the next three between the Bears, Rams, and the Eagles. If they can do that, well, really, no, you know what? No, if you had won today, you could have said one of the next three before the Eagles. Now, obviously, the Eagles are that third game. So Dallas has to win one of the next two against the Bears, at the Bears, or against the Rams in Dallas. And that'll set them up for that winner-take-all, essentially, against Philadelphia Week 16. And then, yeah, you close out with a really bad Washington team at home. Whatever that means, whatever it will mean at that point. So, I don't know what to say, man. It, it's a train wreck right now. And my frustration with the Cowboys could not be much higher. Um, I, I'm just resigned to it. It's 10 years of Jason Garrett as the head coach. We've been talking about this for at least seven years. About how bad... I don't think he's a terrible coach. I think if you were to rank the head coaches in the league, I would probably put him in the dead center. But when you have, you think, A-plus talent, and you're talking all year, all offseason long, that you think this is the most talented team you've had since 2007, which sent 13 players to the Pro Bowl. It was a 13-3 and record. And frankly, was probably one of your two best chances to go get a Super Bowl with Tony Romo. You, you had that opportunity. You were the one seed in the NFC and you let it go, and you let it go. <sighs> you compare to that team. I started I started to start talking about 2007 more than I needed to for this train of thought. You compared yourself to that team. That team was 12-1 and one at one point, with that one loss being to the, at that point, at, by the time they were 12-1, and one, the team that had beaten them was 13-0, and 0, the Patriots. That's how good that team was. And that's what you're comparing yourself to. So the fact that you're even in a 6-6 six and six situation, the fact that you are winless against teams with a winning record, the fact that we've seen all of this from Jason Garrett. In 07, he was the offensive coordinator, and people thought he was the next boy genius. You're sitting in that situation, and I would say by 2010, when he finally became the head coach, the interim head coach that year, and then we had the first string of three and or eight and eight seasons, the three straight of those, as he took over, he wasn't ready for the job, and I was I was done with him by, I gave him fourteen, fourteen. I thought okay, let him roll it back. Fifteen was a train wreck, but he had the injuries to cap it on. Sixteen, I, I by sixteen I was completely out. I was like, all right, I, I'm not gonna believe in this guy or follow this guy. I've got lulled back into thinking in 18 and even the start of this year, hey, this team is so good, so talented. Maybe, just maybe, they can make something happen in spite of him. That they have a team so good and playing so well that even his vanilla-ass offense 
and poor management of the game can't can't undermine them. I don't feel that way anymore. And I think even though Garrett acts like he's a robot and acts like he doesn't see or hear what the outside forces are saying, again, I, I think it proves that he does because you see it seems like he does exactly what he was criticized for mercilessly that week or that previous week. He'll address that directly in that game, and suddenly it's like, for one week, he'll do exactly what you asked for, and whether it works out or not, most of the time it does, he'll be like, oh, see, there you go, there you go. But then by the next week, it's completely forgotten. He'll do that, or you'll see it in his body language this game. You can tell he's he's feeling that pressure, and it's only natural, too. But he's losing control of this thing. After the game, before the media even got in there, uh, they were saying you could hear some cowboy, at least one cowboy, screaming viciously in the locker room, just furious venting. Couldn't tell exactly who it was or what was being said, but it was just several minutes of just a tirade in the locker room. The press was kept away from the whole thing, and I assume it's someone on the defense, a leader on the defense, but I, whoever it is, man, it, it's irrelevant. It just shows to me. At the very least, he's lost the defense. I don't think he's lost the offense because I think Dak, Zeke, and Cooper, you know, Dak and Cooper haven't gotten paid yet, so obviously they're going to keep balling out and fighting as hard as they can because they don't want it to be an example of like, well, hey, when we needed you in this moment, you kind of quit on us. They're not going to do that. And Zeke, he got paid, yeah, but I think Zeke was, you know, in this case, he was having a good game anyway, and, you know, with the way the game kind of developed, he didn't have as many carry opportunities in the second half, so... It just kind of materialized in a way where it was like, all right, well, shit, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, we're out here and we're fighting. We're just not getting the job done. You can hang that part on us. But uh, the defense, they look like they've largely quit. Not all of them, but enough of them um, in general. So I, I don't know if this thing gets fixed or not this year. At this point, I almost, I, I don't want to say I welcome implosion this year. I just want to make sure that Garrett's gone. That's it. If if we make the playoffs and win a wild card game, or well, we wouldn't be in a wild card game. Well, yeah, we would be in a wild card game, but we wouldn't be um, a road team. I just want to make sure Garrett doesn't somehow eke out one more playoff win. And it's like, oh, there you go. New job. Huh? Look at that. Look at that role we ended on. You know, Jerry said in the week, that uh, is pretty much, he seemed to insinuate quotes out there, insinuated. It was pretty much Super Bowl or bust for Jason. Like, I don't have Jerry, you know, it's Jerry speak. It's confusing as hell. But pretty much saying, you know, you know what? I don't have to come in first every year. There's been years I finished six and had a hell of a good time, which is a weird quote. But uh, at this point, yeah, it, it pretty much is there, you know. you Your performance reflects on me as the general manager because you're out there, you and your personnel your staff are out there based on my decision and my uh accommodation essentially so you got to do it because you're reflecting poorly on me well it didn't look any better this week in fact i would argue it was maybe their second worst performance of the year like really really bad and uh i don't know I don't know how this gets better. I don't know if I even care to see it get better right this minute because, like I said, if Garrett's gone, then I feel like we can at least start start fresh and try and get a fresh voice in here, maybe find a coach who knows what they're doing and who can actually manage a game after 10-plus years at the job. So that's all my time, guys. I know I've been rattling on. It's Thanksgiving. <laughs> Not a great Thanksgiving as far as Cowboys football is concerned, but... uh. We'll make it we'll make it work. So until next time, remember every legend was once a prospect. Salute.